Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you, but it was unnecessary. <laughs> yeah. Um. Looks like everybody quiet. All right. Okay. So I think I'll just get started. Um. Yeah. Uh, you already know my name, Richard. I work as a software engineer for Empama. And I also help as a technical reviewer for data science courses and books for that. And then I also write sometimes for analytics media. Um, yes, so that is just a disclaimer. I'm not going to be talking about what machine learning is, what applications of machine learning are, um, what algorithms to use, what frameworks or libraries to use, mainly because we've had several talks talking about the same thing and I think it will be redundant, right? So, this is actually what I want to talk about. Um, we've had a lot of talks about, and then I think quite a number of you asked questions about how to get started and what to do. And then I also think that a few of you also have, you know, started doing some form of data science or machine learning. And I want to talk about the stuff that the tutorials and then the books don't cover, and some of the lessons that I have learned in my job as a software engineer and as a machine learning engineer, and also give my two pathways on how to get started in the field, right? Yeah. So, um, this talk was originally given by a good friend of mine, Jade Abbott. I just wanted to give her a shout. Um, she's from South Africa, and she's also a machine learning engineer. And also a member of the deep learning in Daba, like the main community. Yeah. Um, so this is actually the last time I'm going to talk about anything related to what machine learning is. Um, so you have some data, you do analysis, you do some training, you have your model, you put it in a production system. But it looks that simple, but sometimes it's not. Because of we the way we work is I think most courses, almost um, tutorials, have put their focus on. So we've been having a lot of conversations about why data science is key, and a lot of the work, you know, tends to end up in Egyptian notebooks or something like that. But then we also have to understand that we are working with data, and then we are also doing working with code, and most of the things that we do is iterative, and so you get to have that problem where you do something today and then you iterate over it tomorrow and then it's changed, right? But then you also have to come back sometimes or I don't you have to refer to some previous version of your code or some previous version of your data and it becomes very difficult to do that because well your courses didn't tell you about that, right? And so most of the things I'm going to talk about now is um, also mostly related to stuff that you would have to do when somebody is actually paying you to do machine learning or data science or you know you have a customer waiting for the products that you are trying to build for them or the solution you are trying to provide. Yeah, so um, so over here the stuff that, that tutorials don't cover will include things like version control, um, testing, performance metrics, reproducibility, actually putting your models in production, and then a little bit of ethics. I talk about that one again. Yeah, so um, version control is uh, just trying to, you know, record changes that you make to your code or your data, and then saving them in a way that you can come back to previous versions. That's like basically what version control is. Um, what to version when you're doing data science. Um, the general idea is to version everything or anything that you iterate over. Right? So if you're working with code or if, you're, if you have separate um, platforms for your analysis, separate platforms for modeling, if you are working with data on a different environment, try to version everything as much as you can. The, what, what the issue or the problem you might face later on is that sometimes you get to a point where you've done so much iterations over your data that you don't even remember what the initial data looked like, right? And it 
sometimes even difficult to explain that to your customer because then you've destroyed the data to a point where now it's nothing close to what your customer gave you. Right? Yeah, so it's very important to consider version control when you're working in this. Um, these are some of the version control um, softwares that you can use. Um, there's deep uh, get, um, which is something almost everybody knows, and then Quilt. The advice I would give is that try to go with something that is familiar um, when you're starting out, and then eventually you can you know, decide to use some complex um, version control software or anything. Yeah. So the next thing that if I am speaking too fast, you can let me. And oh, well, another thing I wanted to talk about. So I realized very, you know, not long ago that I am not funny, and so I'm not going to try to make any jokes to make you laugh. So every, you know, five minutes, I would just pause and then look over here and then give some ten seconds to laugh. If that's okay. Yeah. Okay. So testing, right? Um, if if you work in software engineering, you you probably know that testing is key to everything you do because things will break and you have to be able to touch them. And in data science, it's the same thing. Like I said, doing data cleaning, doing modeling, doing deployment are all code and you should treat them as such. You should write tests for everything that is testable. Um, test your data if possible. When I say test your data, I mean, so think about this. If you, you have data and every now and then you, you know, keep adding more and as you continue to do your analysis, say you do some media, you realize that your data is not good enough or it's not there yet, so you want to add a few things, right? You add a few things and you realize that it broke everything. Now, if you don't have tests for it, what happens is that you either have to go look for the initial data from wherever you got it from, and if that's not possible, then you, I don't want to say you fuck, but then you fuck. Yeah, and so you have to try to test your data as much as possible. That is also um, a challenge that we all, in production or in real life, you, you know, people are trying to tackle in different ways. The idea is that data can be very, you know, large, and so it becomes difficult to say you have data that has um, 40,000 columns, right? And then you are trying to make sure that every time you add a new column or every time you add a new row, you have some constraints that you have on your fields to make sure that the data you are adding fits those constraints so you don't you know, add any mess data on it. What happens here is now if you add any data, you have to check for every single one of the 14,000 columns that you have, and that can be slow, right? So people mostly try to avoid that. But then the thing is, if you don't start doing it, it becomes technical debt for you, right? And so you go to the ends of your analysis and then realize that you added some data that you didn't realize was bad, but then during the analysis stages, you realize that, oh, okay, something is going on or something funny is going on somewhere. And now you know that it's the bad data that you added earlier on, but then since you didn't version your data or you didn't version your code, now you don't know which one it is. You get it. So it's a very, you know, these are the kind of problems that initially you don't see how important they are. And that's why most of the courses or most of the books decide to leave them out because it's kind of hard to talk about. But then I'm, what I'm trying to do or the aim of this presentation is to make sure that you know, everybody here or everybody who is trying to do some form of data science has these things at the back of your mind and then you can start looking for ways to you know, implement them in your analysis. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to put this as an idea um, for the brave. You, I, so, um, how many are continuous integration? Yeah, um, I think some of the software developers here know. So, continuous integration is um, basically the idea that 
you're putting software in, you know, you're building software continuously, right? And you want to be able to integrate the different parts of your system every time you push and not wait till after you've built whole chunks of, you know, software and then meet and try to put them together and have that problem where, oh, this thing doesn't work here, it doesn't work here, and then it takes you about two weeks to fix the issues before you can go into production. So continuous integration for software is a so something that has been solved, but then the in when it comes to data, trying to you know write tests related to your data, and then make sure that every time you add new new data, that test like automatically run checks if the data is being destroyed in some way or some form, and then letting you know that okay, this is there's a breakage in your data or there's um, there is no breakage, and so you can continue merging your data. Um, I currently don't know about any, you know, full-fledged solutions to this problem, but then it's a problem that if you could solve it, could make you a lot of money. Yeah. So if you are brave, you can start tackling this, as, you know, some of the, or as a, even as a way to get started into data science because well, data is everything. Yeah. So, oh, that looks funny. So another thing that I also wanted to talk about is performance metrics. Right? So we've had a lot of talks about um, building machine learning models and trying to figure out how good they are. And then we had a couple of mentions of 99% accuracy. I haven't seen that in real life. But the one thing I wanted to let you know is so Mostly in data science courses, you hear about things like accuracy, precision, recall, F score, and things like that. And that's OK. In most cases, that works. But then you also have to understand that data science, the point of you doing data science for machine learning is to, is to solve a problem for your company or for your fans, right? And so there are some cases where it becomes very um, necessary that you have or that you apply um, performance metrics that have some basis on the domain that you are in. I will give you an example. So, assuming that we want to fix in, in the domain that we are in, we are trying to serve you know, some high speed predictions to certain customers. Okay, so let's say we work in finance, right? And then we are trying to predict. Um, how stocks will rise, whether stocks will rise or not, right? And in that field, they work to like that second, right? And so you need to be able to deliver predictions as fast as possible, right? In a situation like that, you have to make certain trade-offs between how accurate your model is and then how fast the predictions are, you know, happening. So say you have two models, you've been able to build two models, and then most of the evaluation is you know, trying to figure out um, which model is better, right? And so you have two models. One is giving you 99% accuracy. The other one is giving you 95, right? In that scenario, you might think that, okay, the 99% is good, so then I'm going to go with 99. But then you realize that um, the 99% model is so large that it's giving you predictions like 10 minutes later, and so that is unacceptable, right? So in that domain, it becomes more advisable to add the speed at which predictions are being made as part of your you know, um, performance metric. Right? So in that situation, then you'd rather go for a model that gives you about 95% accuracy, but then also um, offer you predictions in less than a second. Right. So business domain or domain expertise is important when you are coming up with performance metrics, but then most of the time, the accuracy, the F1 scores, and everything is good. You just have to keep in mind that domain expertise is necessary when you're coming up with performance metrics. Yeah. So, let's, um, the next thing I also want to talk about is reproducibility. That is something that is um, very important to me. I've given a couple of talks about it. But then, the, Reproducibility became um, necessary for me when I started using um, certain software engineering tools like Docker. 
Um, and the, the, the thing is, so if you work in software engineering, right, and then you are put in, or if you work mostly with microservices, you tend to hear about containers, 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 right? And the thing about containers is they make it easier for you to you know, package applications with all the dependencies and everything you need to be able to run it. And so you don't have that problem where it runs on the machine, but then it doesn't run on your, you know, your colleague's machine or anything like that, right? But then in data science, mostly what happens is if you work in a team, so you have, say, your data analyst, you have the data scientist, and then you have some QA person, right? And somebody does some analysis, wants verification from their colleague, they copy their Jupyter notebook. Data scientists love their Jupyter notebook. That's true, right? How many of us use Jupyter notebook here? Ah, there's a number here. Okay. So you have some analysis in your Jupyter notebook, and then you pass it on to your friend. But then you, what you realize is maybe your friend is using a different version of Python, maybe they're using a different version of even Jupyter notebook itself, right? And so now the problem is if you are using a different version that has some updates or if you're using the latest version of Jupyter notebook that offers you some you know, updates that your colleague doesn't have, then you have to also go through the whole problem of trying to fix their errors or fix whatever is not making their analysis run, even before you can run it and then give feedback, right? So it becomes very important. And then even in cases where, so there are companies that, you know, mostly in large companies, you have data scientists doing the analysis and then they don't touch anything related to you know, how they go into production, right? And so the team that works on taking models into production have to run the uh, models first and then see that they actually, you know, build and they do their production stuff. So that becomes like a very important aspect of doing data science because then if you have the whole, it runs on my machine, it doesn't run on my colleague's machine, then it means you are delaying the, you know, time of, you are increasing latency between how, when you build a model and then when they go into production, right? And so reproducibility is important for you to be able to run the same analysis with the same data, with the same you know, code, and then get the same results that your colleague had. It's very, very, very important. I can't stress on how important it is. But then it's very important. And there's a saying by Karl Popper that says that non-reproducible single occurrences are of no significance to science. This is very um, necessary when, say, you have a client. Right? A client gives you some problem they want to solve. They give you data. You go do your analysis, and now you want to you want to explain, you know, what you did to your client. But for some reason, your laptop is off. But then you have the code on GitHub, right? And so you go download the code onto your client's machine or whoever's machine, and then you want to run the analysis. If now you run the analysis, but then the environment you're running the analysis in is totally different from where you did the initial analysis, right? And so you start to get different results for some reason. That has nothing, it has no relevance to your customer because if, say, you started out, you did your analysis and then you found some interesting, you know, you, you found some insight that you think, oh, this, this is good, this is going to make money, right? But then you run it and then you realize, ah, it's not the same. You can't base um, your argument on the fact that, oh, I did it in the morning and then it worked. You are fired. Okay, so the, it, it becomes very important for us to be able to reproduce the results that we get. And also mostly in research, that if you are a researcher and then you, you know, come up with some strategy or some algorithm that does some really interesting thing that we all care about, but then can reproduce it, then what's the point? Right? Yeah, so reproducibility is important, and there are several ways to deal with, you know, or to handle being able to reproduce and get science results, but then personally, um, Docker is the tool that I have used, and then it, it works, right? So, um, the advice that I wanted to give also was that sometimes you just have to use what works for you or use what you're comfortable with. So I have a software engineering background and I use, I use Docker to you know, um, make sure that 
software runs the same way everywhere, right? So then why don't I use the same thing when I'm doing data science? Yeah, so Docker is um, a containerization um, tool that allows you to package everything. So containerization is the technology, and then Docker is just a tool that helps you. Um, okay, I, I think this is about time for me to turn to laugh. Ah, nobody. Tough crowd. <laughs> All right, so um, I want. I just want to talk about um, interpre interpretability. Oh shit! <laughs> interpretability. Um, that is just being able to, you know, explain what your model is doing and then how it's doing what it's doing. Right? It's as simple as that. Um, in depending on the domain that you work in, it may or may not be necessary. Right? So, say you work in the field of e-commerce. A simple example, you want to do sentiment analysis, right? All you care about is being able to know if your sentiment is positive or negative or neutral. You don't care about how it's doing it, you just care about it being positive or negative. But then if you work in finance and you are trying to, you know, determine who gets a loan and who doesn't, right? Because of issues of, you know, governance and compliance and things like that, you can't just use any machine learning model or any deep learning model and say that, oh, you get a loan, you don't get a loan. No. If somebody decided to take you on, you'd have to explain why you refuse person A alone and then give person B that you know, loan. And so, depending on the field that you work in, once again, interpre interpretability is something that you have to you know, spend some time on trying to understand how to you know, explain models. And this is something that is easier to do when you are working with, you know, statistical models or when you're working with classic machine learning algorithms like linear regression and logistic regression, but then it becomes very difficult for you to do when you are working with deep learning and those black box models. And so, you know, you have to sort of make that conscious decision to use some particular model in some particular domain depending on how much you care about this. Yeah. So, Going into production, um, th this is something that is very much overlooked in most science courses. Um, have we, you know, do we have people here who are self taught or have taken some data science courses? Have you ever seen anything about taking models into production before? I haven't. You have? Which course? What's there? Fast AI. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, but then most, you know, data science courses on Coursera and Udemy, University even falls um, under those categories. Um, it, it's something that is overlooked mainly because going into production is more of a software engineering problem, and you know you, the, the courses focus solely on data science. But then you can't do this is science, or build some model and then leave it on your machine. It's useless, right? So, if as data scientists, you you need to have some idea of, you know, taking how to take your models into production, and then also you have to consider the production environment that your models are going to run in, right? So those really affect um, the models that you build. Uh, an example would be. Um, how many of us know about the Netflix right? So it's a competition by Netflix. Yes, it had a $1 million prize on it. The winners of the competition, the model they built actually couldn't be used because it was too big to put into product. Right? So if somebody wins a $1 million prize, but then the model is just useless because they can't do anything. With it. They tried over several months. But then it still couldn't go into production, and so they had to build a whole new. Model. That's the kind of, or that's how costly, you know, building models or building models and not thinking about, you know, production environment in which they are going to run, how costly they can be. Because sometimes you think that, oh, I'm just a data scientist, I don't have to worry about taking models into production. But then you have also have to understand that you are working in a company or you're working for a business that needs to make money, 
and your time as a resource to the company. And so if the company is paying you for your time and you spend your time building a model that cannot be sent into production, then it's just the company losing money, right? So we have to, you know, think about how ah, got requirement wrong. Sorry about that. Um, so we have to think about taking models into production. And these are the five, you know, things that I wanted to highlight when you are taking models into production. You have to think about how accessible your models are. Um, accessibility in this case means that you build models that you know you want to be used depending on the kind of model you build or the kind of solution you're coming up with. You want to be able to make sure that your models can be used on a phone, on a laptop, or anywhere. Like anything that is going to use your model has to be able to make predictions out of it. right? And so you have to think about that. But then I will also say that some, most of these um, problems, I think performance, performance and scalability and maintenance are the ones that you know fall mostly to the data scientists. And I will explain each of them. So performance mostly is you want to be able to make predictions as fast as possible, right? Um, fast is relative, but then depending on the domain you're working in, once again, you also have to be able to make sure that you are making predictions in a time that is good enough or a time that is acceptable. And the size of your model, which is key to performance, may affect your production environment in a good way or in a bad way, right? So, Performance is key. Um, force tolerance is just making sure that when errors occur in production, you are able to recover as quickly as possible. Right? So it's going to happen. Of something is going to break in production, but then you want to be able to, you know, recover as quickly as possible. And sometimes it may not be the job of a data scientist. It may not be the, you know, usual work of a data scientist to think about this. But then. One thing that I also make clear is that in our you know, environment or in our context as in Ghana, one thing you realize is that if you start working as a data scientist, chances are you'll be the only one doing it, right? And so if you're the only one doing this, then you have to know, at least know about these things or know enough to be able to know where to look, right? So yes, it's important for you to think about Fault tolerance when you are putting models into production. Um, scalability is also about. So, say you have a model that is seven, you know, predictions in you know some acceptable amount of time. So, say you you want to be able to make predictions in a second, right? And for one person, yes, it does that. But for say a thousand people or a million people, you start to realize that your you know, performance starts to decrease for one reason or the other. And so you have to keep this in check depending on how many users or who you are building your model for. These, okay, um, maintenance is just, um, so you generate data every, every day, every second, right? You are continuously generating data and then you want to be able to make sure that you know, you are updating your models every now and then with the data that you are getting in, right? When you are going into production, you also have to consider how easy it is for you to replace older models with newer versions, right? So if you couple your whole production environment with the initial model, then replacing it will be very difficult for you to do. But then you have to think about ways that you can make sure that, you know, it's easy to replace models or it's easy to revert models back to older versions as quickly as possible, yes. Um, what I wanted to say is all these five are important, but then depending on the environment you're working in, you might want to, you know, you might care about some more than others. Yes, so now ethics. I, actually, I don't know much about ethics. That's the truth. I, I don't know much about ethics. I try to you know, read about ethics in, in the context of the job that I do. But then 
one thing that we have to understand is we build these solutions for ourselves, right? And then sometimes our lives are dependent on it. And so we kind of have to make sure that we are building things that are safe for us and for you know, our neighbors. And think about other people when you're building things. You don't have to think about you and your family and or how much money you're going to make when you deploy some money, right? You, there, there needs to be a longer conversation about ethics and what is right and what is wrong, but this is not going to be that conversation or today is not going to be that day. So I'm just putting it here and then letting you know that you might not find it in some, you know, course that you will take, but then it's necessary that we start conversations about ethics and data science and how they, you know, interact and how they affect us or how the models we build affect our lives, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's that. So, yeah, those were the main things that I wanted to point out that in, you know, though we're trying to build our careers in data science and, you know, become solve solutions or come up with solutions that will make our lives easier. In the course of training or in your you know, course of studies, these are things that you may not have come across, but then in production you will kind of have to, or you have to know about these things and then know how to implement them to be able to be a successful data scientist. So like, the next thing I'll talk about are some general you know, lessons that I have learned in my very short um, the first thing is not everything is a machine learning problem, for real. Um, you can't go around building models for everything you see. It, I can't stress on that enough. So, I actually have this experience where I was asked to, you know, find a solution to something that in my boss's head, it was a machine learning problem, right? But it turns out it wasn't. And so, I go to him and I say, oh, this is not a machine learning problem. Method to solve the problem and it will be fine. And the response I got back is not very pretty, but uh, we we have to understand that we we have some solutions or some problems that we have can be solved with other methods apart from machine learning. And so maybe sometimes we should just look at you know using other methods before we think about using machine learning. And that is something that you know. If we talk about at the machine learning conference, it's a little controversial, but then that's the truth, right? Not everything is a machine learning problem. And so hence Mr. Robert got cancer. That's not because machine learning there wasn't a machine learning problem, no. Yeah. Um, so the other thing is sometimes bad data is all you have. Yes. We talked about how data is key to everything you do as a data scientist. Literally, in the room. Right. So data is key to everything you do, but then sometimes you just have bad data. You, there's nothing you can do about it. Let me give you an example. You get hired by a company to do data science for them, right? But then mostly what happens is companies storing data don't store data with the mindset that they are going to do some data science on it or some analysis on it later on. So they store data how, however, it says convenient to them and what they are doing at that particular time, right? And so if you join the company, what you realize is they have very, very bad data. And there's nothing you can do about that. You can't wait six months until they have good data before you start doing something, right? Because you just sit there doing nothing. So sometimes you just have to start with the bad data you have. We have algorithms and computational power to some degree to be able to learn something even from bad data. I'm not saying that put bad models into production. I'm just saying sometimes bad data is all you have and you should try doing something with the bad data and then iterating over that than just sitting down and saying, oh, we don't have data. I say this because sometimes when we have arguments about you know, how Africa is lagging when it comes to the whole machine learning space or industry, the first argument people say is, oh, we don't have data in Ghana, we don't have data in Africa. That's not true. We have data, we just don't know how to collect it. Or sometimes we have data, it's just not enough, or it's not in their state that we want it to be, right? 
but then we can still start solving problems or we can still start formulating you know, solutions to some of these problems with the bad data we have and then iterate over them to the point where we have good data to be able to put it in, into production. Um, yeah, so, yeah. And also, another thing that I wanted to talk about is choosing machine learning libraries and framework. Um, I get this question a lot. What framework should I use? What library should I use? Um, which one over that? Sometimes it's not necessary. Really, the short answer is, Focus on your people over your tools. If you are building a data science team, or if you get hired by a company to, use, you know, to build a data science team, or you are the only data scientist and you want to start using, or you want to start doing you know, some analysis, but then you're wondering which framework to use or which library to use, go with what you know. Because the time that it will take you for you to learn a whole new framework, you could have used that with the knowledge you already had to do something and provide value to the company you were working right? And if you're building a data science team, it's not necessary or it doesn't help you. Say you have a team of three, two people know how to use scikit-learn, um, one person knows how to use TensorFlow, or even two people know how to use scikit-learn, and then the rest don't have any preferences or anything like that. You have two people experiencing something and they could help the other one get to you know wherever they are. So the the trick or how to handle that situation sometimes you just try to you know use the tools that maximize the you know the outputs of your team and then if it becomes necessary for you to change it, you change it. Really. Um, sometimes too you also have to think about stability and then how these frameworks perform in production. So and I, uh, that's how I would explain that. Is, um, so in the three team problem that we have, we have two people who already know framework A, right? and then we are discussing which framework to use. But then we, we, we decided, OK, let's focus on our strengths, and so we decided to go with framework A. But then the issue might be that Framework A doesn't perform very well in production, right? So in case like that, then you have to also make the trade-off between how well or how fast you will be able to, you know, solve production issues, or do some very rigorous analysis on what it means for that model or for you to use that, you know, framework in production. If it's something you can deal with, you go with whatever your team is stronger. But then if it's something you can't deal with, then you move to a new one, right? So the core, the core uh, advice or the core takeaway from this is it's always a good idea to go with what you know, to go with what you are good at, and then get some value from that. If it becomes necessary, you change it, right? And so say you, you are still arguing about you know, what's to use because then you are torn between choosing something that you know or something that will be good in production. I think for just this one, follow the crowd. Just for this, not the other things in life. Um, I'm not responsible. But for just this one, if you happen to be in that, you know, zone where you can't really go with what you know, and then you still can't decide between what is good in production and what is not. It's good to go with you know um, what is popular, mainly because before these tools get popular, it would have been used by a great number of people who have built things and tested them like over several periods of time to be able to tell you that oh okay. Um, we like this, we don't like it. Right? And a very good way to know um, what is popular is check their GitHub pages. You can count the number of stars, and then that's like a very easy way. Most of these um, machine learning frameworks are, or libraries are open source, and so it'll be easy for you to figure out which one is popular and which one is not. But then only make that decision after you've gone through, you know, having to make the choice of what you're good at, 
o yo soy una de las crisis que me hace la gente, pues es tan difícil que es que yo puedo hacer. Yes, so, this is, um, I think somebody asked the first thing about the thing earlier yeah, today, um, about choosing deep learning accesses. Yes, it's true, it's a research problem, and sometimes you just have to, a good, a good place for you to start is depending on the problem you're solving. Um, try to read research around that domain, and then see what methods are being used, or what objectives are being used. And then, um, say you're building some deep learning model, you don't know, you know how many layers or how many units you should use, just try to overfit your data with as many models as possible and then apply regularization from there. But then you also have to you know, make that, have that mental note that the more layers you have, the bigger your model. And so you know, the higher you go, the more difficult it might be to put the models in production. So just try to you know, overfit the data that you have and then use some regularization method to you know, generalize to the rest of your data or the product that, that you have. And then get a good place to start. But then mostly research papers is the way to go. And then I can't stress on this enough. So mostly what happens is you go through a data science course or even a series of courses and then you get to know some, you know, techniques that you can use to build things quickly. And that is good. But then what happens in real life is you get to, or you are assigned a problem that wasn't part of the tutorials, or a problem that you have no idea where to start from. And it's important for you to be able to know how to quickly go through like, several research papers within that you know, domain, or what this research is doing within that space and then be able to implement those things and then compare to one work thing. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think this is the final part of my presentation. I would like to, you know, talk about how to get started in the field of data science and in the field of machine learning. Um, mostly because we've had a number of people talk about this. And yeah, so what what I tell most of the people that ask me about how to get started with data science is um, try to understand what data science is for. Um, it might not be for you, it might be for you. But then if you understand what it is and how it's being applied, then you know that okay, you have some you know, mental framework to do. And if you realize that it's still something that you want to do or something you want to pursue, then try to learn the basics just the basics. Don't try to overcomplicate your life by learning deep learning from the start. It won't help you. Try to learn the basics. Try to learn some statistics. Try to learn some, you know, basic. Or try to understand the fundamental process of data science. That it's about solving problems and not about building models, right? So if you understand that, then you can build from there and then how to collect data for your problem that you're trying to solve how to do some analysis on this. And then, you know, once you are comfortable with the basics, you can start solving problems. Um, Kago or Kago? I say Kago, but then people say it's Kago. It's Kago, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can use Kago, Kago, whatever it is. It's a very good place to start. There is also a platform called Zindi. I don't know who knows about Zindi here. Yes, um, Zindi is a very, you know, it's an African centric table, kind of, right? Yeah, can we give him a hand of applause? Yeah. yeah, Zindi is also a very good place to start because, you know, they're trying to solve African problems, and are we African, so we should try to solve our own problems yeah, before we go to Yeah, yeah. Um, so, if the when you get comfortable with the basics, try to solve problems first. I say this because, you know, that sometimes you don't know what you don't know. 
that's that's the thing. That's the problem most people, you know, the trap most people fall in. You don't know what you don't know, and you try to know everything from the start. And we have people standing here with PhDs and things like that, and they still don't know everything, right? So if you want to know everything before you start, then I don't know what to say to you, but yeah, you so you know, learn the basics, solve some problems, and then you know, try to read other people's work. Um, the, I put papers with code first because I really like it. It's a platform where you can get um, research papers and then their implementation, and so you don't really have to go and write everything from scratch. Which is a good idea if you know you are learning because sometimes you just have to know how to implement it. Right? First, uh, yeah. So papers with code is a very good place to start. If you are working, assuming you are on a deadline and then you have to reproduce things like very fast, you can't go wrong with papers with code unless the paper is not there. And uh, Medium is also a very good place. People write about all their experiences from getting started with data science to using some libraries or some methods that you found. And so you can subscribe to certain channels on Medium, and then you'll be getting these frequent you know, articles that are within the science you know, field. And then I mean, you can try to read at least two a day, and then by the time you realize you know about so many things, and they might not be relevant to you at that time, but then when the time they become necessary, you know that, oh, okay, I read about this thing somewhere, and then I can apply it. Yes. So, and then oh, archive is um, a platform where the you know, research papers are mostly published, so you can download almost every research paper. I don't know about other fields, but then I know that for machine learning um, papers, does, can anybody confirm if archive is for general you know, research papers? Yeah, so for sure, I know that if you want machine learning papers, just go to archive. You might find it there. And attend events like this and then continue solving problems. It becomes very important when you are you know, at events like this because um, when I started doing data science, I didn't know anybody. And so you had conversations with yourself and then sometimes you start to feel like you're going crazy. But then at events like this, you get to meet people who are also interested in the things that you're interested in and then you can start conversations around that. You can form teams to work on projects if you know you find something that you are all interested in. And then that's a very good way to get started. Yeah. Um, and then you learn the rest of the things as you go. One thing you would realize is as you start to work on projects, you will start finding problems that, you know, uh, something new, and then you have to just go and learn about them, and then come and continue with your project, right? So, if you are here and then you are thinking about how to get started, but then you want to, you know, find the whole scope of what science, you would, you, you would get scared. Yeah, because data science is a very broad field, and then if you map out everything you have to learn, you start to learn how to paint the next day. <laughs> yeah, so I think um, thank you very much for you know taking the time to listen to me.